The Book of Tobit and Post Traumatic Sin this week. This week, we will read from the Book of Tobit and see clips and highlights of Joy DeGruy's 2004 lecture on post traumatic slavery disorder. Next week, we will analyze the Book of Tobit and also analyze the consequences of sin in Tobit and other places in Scripture. The Book of the Words of Tobit, son of Tobiel, the son of Ananiel, the son of Adu, the son of Gabio, of the seed of Azael, of the tribe of Naphtali, who in the time of Enemesar, king of the Assyrians, was led captive out of Thisbe, which is at the right hand of that city, which is called properly Naphtali in Galilee above Aser. I, Tobit, have walked all the days of my life in the ways of truth and justice, and I did many alms deeds to my brethren and my nation, who came with me to Nineveh and to the land of the Assyrians. And when I was in my own country, in the land of Israel, being but young, all the tribe of Naphtali, my father, fell from the house of Jerusalem, which was chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, that all the tribes should sacrifice there, where the temple of the habitation of the Most High was consecrated and built for all ages. Now all the tribes which together revolted in the house of my father, Naphtali, sacrificed unto the heifer for all. But I alone went often to Jerusalem at the feast, as it was ordained unto all the people of Israel by an everlasting decree, having the first fruits and tents of increase with that which was first shorn. And them gave I at the altar to the priests, the children of Aharon. The first tenth part of all increase I gave to the sons of Aharon, who ministered at Jerusalem. Another tenth part I sold away and went and spent it every year at Jerusalem. And the third I gave unto them to whom it was meet, as Deborah, my father's mother, had commanded me, because I was left an orphan by my father. Furthermore, when I was come to the age of a man, I married Anna of my own kindred, and of her I begot Tobias. And when we were carried away captives to Nineveh, all my brethren and those that were of my kindred did eat of the bread of the Gentiles. But I kept myself from eating, because I remembered Yah with all my heart. And the Most High gave me grace and favor before Enemesar, so that I was his purveyor. And I went into Media, and left in trust with Gabael, the brother of Gabriel, at Regis, a city of Media, ten talents of silver. Now when Enemesar was dead, and Akareb, his son, reigned in his stead, whose estate was troubled, that I could not go into Media. And in the time of Enemesar, I gave many alms to my brethren, and gave my bread to the hungry, and my clothes to the naked. If I saw any of my nation dead, or cast about the walls of Nineveh, I buried him. And if the king, son of Rechab, had slain any when he was come, and fled from Judea, I buried them privately, for in his wrath he killed many. But the bodies were not found when they were sought for of the king. And when one of the Ninevites went and complained of me to the king that I buried them and hid myself, understanding that I was sought for to be put to death, I withdrew myself for fear. Then all my goods were forcibly taken away. Neither was there anything left me beside my wife Anna and my son Tobias. And there passed not five and fifty days before two of his sons killed him, and they fled into the mountains of Ararath, and Sarkadonis his son reigned in his stead who appointed over his father's accounts and over all his affairs, Achiacharus, my brother, Anna, Ananel's son. And Achiacharus, entreating for me, I returned to Nineveh. Now Achiacharus was cupbearer and cu keeper of the signet and steward and overseer of the accounts. And Sarkadonus appointed him next unto him, and he was my brother's son. Now when I was come home again, and my wife Anna was restored unto me with my son Tobias, and the Feast of Pentecost, which is the holy feast of the seven weeks, there was a good dinner prepared me, in the which I sat down to eat. And when I saw abundance of meat, I said to my son, Go and bring what poor man soever you shall find out of our brethren, who is mindful of Yah. And lo, I tarry for you. But he came again and said, Father, one of our nation is strangled, and is cast out in the marketplace. Then before I had tasted of any meat, I started up and took him up into a room until the going down of the sun. Then I returned and washed myself and ate my meat in heaviness, remembering the prophecy of Amos, as he said, Your feet shall be turned into mourning, and all your mirth into lamentation. Therefore I wept, and after the going down of the sun, I went and made a grave and buried him. But my neighbors mocked me and said, This man is not yet afraid to be put to death for this matter, who fled away. And yet, lo, he buries the dead again. The same night, also, I returned from the burial and slept by the wall of my courtyard, being polluted, and my face was uncovered. 
and I knew not that there were sparrows in the wall. And mine eyes being opened, the sparrows muted warm dung into mine eyes, and a whiteness came in mine eyes. And I went to the physicians, but they helped me not. Moreover, Achaeacharis did nourish me until I went to Elymas. And my wife Anna did take women's works to do. And when she had sent them home to the owners, they paid her her wages and gave her also besides a kid. And when it was in my house, it began to cry. I said unto her, From whence is this kid? Is it not stolen? Render it to the owners, for it is not lawful to eat anything that is stolen. But she replied upon me, It was given for a gift more than the wages. Howbeit, I did not believe her, but bade her render it to the owners, and I was abashed at her. But she replied upon me, Where are your alms and your righteous deeds? Behold, you and all your works are known. Then I, being grieved, did weep, and in my sorrow prayed, saying, O oh, Yah, you are just, and all your works and all your ways are mercy and truth, and you, tru you judge truly and justly forever. Remember me, and look on me. Punish me not for my sins and ignorance, and the sins of my fathers who have sinned before you. For they obeyed not your commandments, wherefore you have delivered us for a spoil, and unto captivity, and unto death, and for a proverb of reproach to all the nations among whom we are dispersed. And now your judgments are many and true. Deal with me according to my sins and my fathers, because we have not kept your commandments, neither have walked in truth before you. Now, therefore, deal with me as seems best unto you, and command my spirit to be taken from me, that I may be dissolved and become earth. For it is profitable for me to die rather than to live, because I have heard false reproaches and have much sorrow. Command, therefore, that I may now be delivered out of this distress and go into the everlasting peace, Turn not your face away from me. It came to pass the same day that in Ecbatane, a city of Media, Sarah, the daughter of Raguel, Raguel, was also reproached by her father's maids, because that she had been married to seven husbands, whom Asmodeus, the evil spirit, had killed before they had lain with her. Do you not know, said they, that you have strangled your husbands? You, you, have, all, you have had already seven husbands, neither were you named after any of them, Wherefore do you beat us for them? If they be dead, go your ways after them. Let us neither see of you either son or daughter. When she heard these things, she was very sorrowful, so that she thought to have strangled herself. And she said, I am the only daughter of my father, and if I do this, it shall be a reproach unto him, and I shall bring his old age with sorrow unto the grave. Then she prayed toward the window and said, Blessed are you, O Yah, my El and your holy and glorious name is blessed and honorable forever. Let all your works praise you forever. And now, O Yah, I set mine eyes and my face toward you, and say, Take me out of the earth, that I may hear no more the reproach. You know, Yah, that I am pure from all sin with men, and that I never polluted my name, nor the name of my father, in the land of my captivity. I am the only daughter of my father, neither has he any child to be his heir, neither any near kinsman, nor any son of his alive to whom I may keep myself for a wife. My seven husbands are already dead, and why should I live? But if it please not you that I should die, command some regard to be had of me, and pity taken of me, that I hear no more reproach. So the prayers of them both were heard before the majesty of the great El, and Raphael was sent to heal them both, that is, to scale away the whiteness of Tobit's eyes, and to give Sarah, the daughter of Raguel, for a wife to Tobias, the son of Tobit and to bind Asmodeus the evil spirit, because she belonged to Tobias by right of inherit inheritance. The self same time came Tobit home and entered into his house, and Sarah, the daughter of Raguel, came down from her upper chamber. In that day, Tobit remembered the money which he had committed to Gabael and Regis and Media, and said with himself, I have wished for death, wherefore do I not call for my son Tobias, that I may signify to him of the money before I die? And when he had called him, he said, My son, when I am dead, bury me, and despise not your mother, but honor her all the days of your life, and do that which shall please her, and grieve her not. Remember, my son, that she saw many dangers for you when you were in her womb, and when she is dead, bury her by me in one grave. My son, be mindful of Yah, our El, all your days, and let not your will be set to sin or to transgress his commandments. Do uprightly all your life long, and follow not the ways of unrighteousness. For if you deal truly, your doings shall prosperously succeed to you, and to all them that live justly. Give alms of your substance, and when you give alms, let not your eye be envious. Neither turn your face from any poor, 
and the face of Yah shall not be turned away from you. If you have abundance, give alms accordingly. If you have but a little, be not afraid to give according to that little. For you lay up a good treasure for yourself against the day of necessity. Because that alms do deliver from death and suffers not to come into darkness. For alms is a good gift unto all that give it in the sight of the Most High. Beware of all whoredom, my son, and cheaply take a wife of the seed of your fathers, and take not a strange woman to wife, which is not of your father's tribe. For we are the children of the prophets, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. Remember, my son, that our fathers from the beginning, even that they all married wives of their own kindred, and were blessed in their children, and their seed shall inherit the land. Now, therefore, my son, love your brethren, and despise not in your heart your brethren, the sons and daughters of your people, and not taking a wife of them. For in pride is destruction and much trouble, and in lewdness is decay and great want. For lewdness is the mother of famine. Let not the wages of any man which has wrought for you tarry with you, but give him it out of, you, out of hand. For if you serve Yah, he will also repay you. Be circumspect, my son, in all things you do, and be wise in all your conversation. Do that to no man which you hate. Drink not wine to make you drunken. Neither let drunkenness go with you in your journey. Give of your bread to the hungry and of your garments to them that are naked. And according to your abundance, give alms. And let not your eye be envious when you give alms. Pour out your bread on the burial of the just, but give nothing to the wicked. Ask counsel of all that are wise and despise not any counsel that is profitable. Bless Yah your El always and desire of him that your ways may be directed, that all your paths and counsels may prosper. For every nation has not counsel, but Yah himself gives all good things, and he humbles whom he will, as he will. Now, therefore, my son, remember my commandments, neither let them be put out of your mind. And now I signify this, today that I committed ten talents to Gabael, the son of Gabrius, at Regus and Media. And fear not, my son, that we are made poor. For you have much wealth, if you fear Yah, and depart from all sin, and do that which is pleasing in his sight. Tobias then answered and said, Father, I will do all things which you have commanded me, but how can I receive the money, seeing I know him not? Then he gave him the handwriting, and said unto him, Seek you a man which may go with you, whilst I yet live, and I will give him wages, and go and receive the money. Therefore, when he went to seek a man, he found Raphael, that was an angel. But he knew not, and he said unto him, Can you go with me to Regis? And do you know those places well? To whom the angel said, I will go with you, and I know the way well, for I have lodged with our brother Gabael. Then Tobias said unto him, Tarry for me, till I tell my father. Then he said unto him, Go, and tarry not. So he went in and said to his father, Behold, I have found one which will go with me. Then he said, Call him unto me, that I may know of what tribe he is, and whether he be a trusty man to go with you. So he called him, and he came in, and they saluted one another. Then Tobit said unto him, Brother, show me of what tribe and family you are. To whom he said, Do you seek for a tribe or family, or a hired man to go with your son? Then Tobit said unto him, I would know, brother, your kindred and name. Then he said, I am Azarias, the son of Ananias the Great, and of your brethren. Then Tobit said, You are welcome, brother. Be not now angry with me, because I have inquired to know your tribe and your family. For you are my brother, of an honest and good stock. For I know Ananias and Jonathan, sons of that great Semias, as we went together to Jerusalem to worship, and offered the firstborn and the tenths of the fruits, and they were not seduced with the error of our brethren. My brother, you are of a good stock. But tell me, what wages shall I give you? Will you a drachma a day, and things necessary as to mine own son? Yea, moreover, if you return safe, I will add something to your wages. So they were all pleased. Then said he to Tobias, Prepare yourself for the journey, and Yah send you a good journey. And when his son had prepared all things for the journey, his father said, Go you with this man, and Yah who dwells in heaven prosper your journey, and the angel of Yah keep you com company. So they went forth both, and the young man's dog with them. But Anna his mother wept, and said to Tobit, Why have you sent away our son? Is he not the staff of our hand, and going in 
and out before us. Be not greedy to add money to money, but let it be as refuse in respect of our child. For that which Yah has given us to live with does suffice us. Then Tobit to her, Take no care, my sister. He shall return in safety, and your eyes shall see him. For the good angel will keep him company, and his journey will be prosperous, and he shall return safe. Then she made an end of weeping. And as they went on their journey, they came in the evening to the river Tigris, and they lodged there. And when the young man went down to wash himself, a fish leaped out of the river and would have devoured him. Then the angel said unto him, Take the fish. And the young man laid hold of the fish and drew it to land. To whom the angel said, Open the fish and take the heart and the liver and the gall and put them up safely. So the young man did as the angel commanded him. And when they had roasted the fish, they did eat it. Then they both went on their way till they drew near to Ecbatan. Then the young man said to the angel, Brother Azarias, to what use is the heart and the liver and the gall of the fish? And he said unto him, Touching the heart and the liver, If a devil or an evil spirit trouble any, we must make a smoke thereof before the man or the woman, and the party shall be no more vexed. As for the gall, it is good to anoint a man that hath whiteness in his eyes, and he shall be healed. And when they were come near to Regis, the angel said to the young man, Brother, today we shall lodge with Raguel, who is your cousin. He also has one only daughter named Sarah. I will speak for her, that she may be given you for a wife. For to you does the right of her appertain, seeing you only are of her two. And the maid is fair and wise. Now, now, therefore, hear me, and I will speak to her father. And when we return from Regis, we will celebrate the marriage. For I know that Raguel cannot marry her to another, according to the law of Moshe. But he shall be guilty of death, because the right of inheritance does rather appertain to you than to any other. Then the young man answered the angel, I have heard, brother Azariah, that this maid has been given to seven men, who all died in the marriage chamber. And now I am the only son of my father, and I am afraid, lest if I go in unto her, I die, as the other before. For a wicked spirit loves her, which hurts nobody, but those which come unto her. Wherefore, I also fear, lest I die, and bring my father and my mother's life because of me to the grave with sorrow, for they have no other son to bear them. Then the angel said unto him, Do you not remember the precepts which your father gave you, that you should marry a wife of your own kindred? Wherefore, hear me, O my brother, for she shall be given to you to wife, and make you no reckoning of the evil spirit. For this same night she shall be given you in marriage. And when you shall come in into the marriage chamber, you shall take the ashes of perfume, and shall lay upon them some of the heart and liver of the fish, and shall make a smoke with it. And the devil shall smell it, and flee away, and never come again any more. But when you shall come to her, rise up, both of you, and pray to Yah, which is merciful who will have pity on you and save you. Fear not, for she is appointed unto you from the beginning, and you shall preserve her, and she shall go with you. Moreover, I suppose, that she shall bear you children. Now when Tobias had heard these things, he loved her, and his heart was effectually joined to her. And when they were come to Ecbatan, they came to the house of Reguel, and Sarah met them. And after they had saluted one another, she brought them into the house. Then said Raguel to Edna, his wife, How like is this young man to Tobit, my cousin? And Raguel asked them, Where are you from, brethren? To whom they said, We are of the sons of uh, Naphtali, which are captives in Nineveh. Then he said to them, Do you know Tobit, our kinsman? And they said, We know him. Then he said, Then said he, Is he in good health? And they said, He is both alive and in good health. And Tobias said, He is my father. Then Raguel leaped up and kissed him and wept and blessed him and said unto him, You are the son of an honest and good man. But when he had heard that Tobit was blind, he was sorrowful and wept. Likewise, Edna, his wife, and Sarah, his daughter, wept. Moreover, they entertained them cheerfully. And after that, they had killed a ram of the flock. They set store of meat on the table. Then said Tobias to Raphael, Brother Azarias, speak so he communicated the matter with Raguel, and Raguel said to Tobias, Eat and drink, and make merry, for it is meet that you should marry my daughter. Nevertheless, I will declare unto you the truth. I have given my daughter in marriage to seven men, who died that night they came in unto her. Nevertheless, for the present, be merry. But Tobias said, I will eat nothing here till we agree and swear to one another. Swear one to another. 
Raguel said, Then take her from henceforth, according to the manner, for you are her cousin, and she is yours. And the merciful El give you good success in all things. Then he called his daughter Sarah, and she came to her father, and he took her by the hand and gave her to be wife to Tobias, saying, Behold, take her after the law of Moses or Moshe, and lead her away to your father. And he blessed them. And called Edna his wife, and took paper, and did write an instrument of covenants, and sealed it. Then then they began to eat. After Raguel called his wife Edna, and said unto her, Sister, prepare another chamber, and bring her in there. Which when she had done as he had bidden her, she brought her there, and she wept, and she received the tears of her daughter, and said unto her, Be of good comfort, my daughter. El of heaven and earth give you joy for this your sorrow. Be of good comfort, my daughter. And when they had supped, they brought Tobias in unto her. And as he went, he remembered the words of Raphael, and took the ashes of the perfumes, and put the heart and the liver of the fish thereupon, and made a smoke therewith. The which smell, when the evil spirit had smelled, he fled into the utmost parts of Egypt, and the angel bound him. And after that, they were both shut in together. Tobias rose out of the bed and said, Sister, arise, and let us pray that Yah would have pity on us. Then began Tobias to say, Blessed are you, O El of our fathers, and blessed is your holy and glorious name forever. Let the heavens bless you and all your creatures. You made Adam and gave his, gave him Kava, his wife, for a helper and stay. Of them came mankind. You have said, It is not good that man should be alone. Let us make unto him an aid like unto himself. And now, O Yah, I take not this my sister for lust, but uprightly. Therefore, mercifully ordain that we may become aged together. And she said with him, Amen. So they slept both that night, and Raguel rose and went and made a grave, saying, I fear lest he also be dead. When Raguel was coming to the house, he said unto his wife Edna, Send one of the maids, and let her see whether he be alive. If he be not, that we may bury him, and no man know it. So the maid opened the door, and went in, and found them both asleep, and came forth, and told them that he was alive. Then Raguel praised Yah, and said, O Yah, you are worthy to be praised with all pure and holy praise. Therefore, let your saints praise you with all your creatures, and let your, all your angels and your elect praise you ever. You are to be praised, for you have made me joyful, and that is not come to me which I suspected. But you have dealt with us according to your great mercy. You are to be praised because you have had mercy of two that were the only begotten children of their fathers. Grant them mercy, O Yah, and finish their life in health with joy and mercy. Then Raguel bade his servants to fill the grave. And he kept the wedding feast fourteen days. For before the days of the marriage were finished, Raguel had said unto him by an oath that he should not depart till the fourteen days of the marriage were expired. And then he should take the half of his goods and go in safety to his father, and should have the rest when I and my wife be dead. Then Tobias called Raphael and said unto him, Brother Azariah, take with you a servant and two camels, and go to Regis of Media to Gabael, and bring me the money, and bring him to the wedding. For Raguel has sworn that I shall not depart. But my father counts the days, and if I tarry long, he will be very sorry. So Raphael went out and lodged with Gabael, and gave him the handwriting, who brought forth bags which were sealed up, and gave them to him. And early in the morning they went forth both together, and came to the wedding, and Tobias blessed his wife. Now Tobit, his father, counted every day, and when the days of the journey were expired, and they came not, then Tobit said, Are they detained, or is Gabael dead, and there is no man to give him the money? Therefore he was very sorry. Then his wife said unto him, My son is dead, seeing he stays long. And she began to wail him, and said, Now I care for nothing, my son, since I have let you go, the light of mine eyes. To whom Tobit said, Hold your peace, take no care, for he is safe. But she said, Hold your peace, and deceive me not, my son is dead. And she went out every day into the way which they went, and did eat no meat on the daytime, and ceased not whole nights to bewail her son Tobias, until the fourteen days of the wedding were expired, which Raguel had sworn that he should spend there. Then Tobias said to Raguel, Let me go, for my father and my mother look no more to see me. But his father-in-law said unto him, Tarry with me, and I will send you to your father, and they shall declare unto him how things go with you. But Tobias said, No, but let me go to my father. Then Raguel arose, and gave him Sarah his wife, and half his goods, servants, and cattle, and money. 
And he blessed them and sent them away, saying, The ill of heaven give you a prosperous journey, my children. And he said to his daughter, Honor your father and your mother-in-law, which are now your parents, that I may hear a good report of you. And he kissed her. Edna also said to Tobias, El of heaven restore you, my dear brother, and grant that I may see your children and my daughter Sarah before I die, that I may rejoice before Yah. Behold, I commit my daughter unto you of special choice. Where are, do not entreat her evil. After these things, Tobias went his way, praising Yah that he had given him a prosperous journey, and blessed Raguel and Edna his wife, and went on his way till they drew near unto Nineveh. Then Raphael said to Tobias, You know, brother, how you did leave your father. Let us haste before your wife and prepare the house, and take in your hand the gall of the fish. So they went their way, and the dog went after them. Now Anna sat looking about toward the way for her son, and when she had espied him coming, she said to his father, Behold, your son comes, and the man that went with him. So, the, so then said Raphael, I know, Tobias, that your father will open his eyes. Therefore, anoint you his eyes with the gall, and being pricked therewith, he shall rub, and the whiteness shall fall away, and he shall see you. Then Anna ran forth, and fell upon the neck of her son, and said unto him, Seeing I have seen you, my son, from henceforth I am content to die. And they wept both. Tobit also went forth toward the door, and stumbled, but his son ran unto him, and took hold of his father, and he strake of the gall on his father's eyes, saying, Be of good hope, my father. And when his eyes began to smart, he rubbed them, and the whiteness piled away from the corners of his eyes. And when he saw his son, he fell upon his neck. And he wept and said, Blessed are you, O Yah, and blessed is your name forever. And blessed are all your holy angels, for you have scourged and taken pity on me. For behold, I see my son Tobias. And his son went in rejoicing, and told his father the great things that had happened to him in Media. Then Tobit went out to meet his daughter-in-law at the gate of Nineveh, rejoicing and praising Yah. And they which saw him go marveled, because he had received his sight. But Tobias gave thanks before them, because Yah had given mercy, Yah had mercy on him. And when he came near to Sarah, his daughter-in-law, he blessed her, saying, You are welcome, daughter. Yah be blessed, which has brought you unto us, and blessed be your father and your mother. And there was joy among all his brethren which were at Nineveh. And Achaeacharus and Nazbus, his brother's son, came. And Tobias' wedding was kept seven days with great joy. Then Tobit called his son Tobias and said unto him, My son, see that the man have his wages which, which went with you, and you must give him more. And Tobias said unto him, O father, it is no harm to me to give him half of those things which I have brought, for he has brought me again to you in safety, and made my whole, and made whole my wife, and brought me the money, and likewise healed you. Then the old man said, It is due unto him. So he called the angel, and he said unto him, Take half of all that you have brought, and go away in safety. Then he took them both apart, and said unto them, Bless Yah, praise him, and magnify him, and praise him for the things which he has done unto you in the sight of all that live. It is good to praise Yah, and exalt his name, and honorably sh to show forth the works of Yah. Therefore, be not slack to praise him. It is good to keep close the secret of a king, but it is honorable to reveal the works of Yah. Do that which is good, and no evil shall touch you. Prayer is good with fasting and alms and righteousness. A little with righteousness is better than much with unrighteousness. It is better to give alms than to lay up gold. For alms do deliver from death, and shall purge away all sin. Those that exercise alms and righteousness shall be filled with life, but they that sin are enemies to their own life. Surely I will keep close nothing from you. For I said, it was good to keep close the secret of a king, but that it was honorable to reveal the works of Yah. Now therefore, when you did pray, and Sarah your daughter-in-law, I did bring the remembrance of your prayers before the Holy One. And when you did bury the dead, I was with you likewise. And when you did not delay to rise up and leave your dinner to go and cover the dead, your good deed was not hid from me, but I was with you. And now Yah has sent me to heal you and Sarah, your daughter-in-law. I am Raphael, one of the seven holy angels, which present the prayers of the saints and which go in and out before the glory of the Holy One. Then they were both troubled and fell upon their faces, for they feared. But he said unto them, Fear not, for it shall go well with you. Praise Yah, therefore. 
for not of any favor of mine, but by the will of our L, I came, and wherefore I uh, wherefore praise him forever. All these days I did appear unto you, but I did neither eat nor drink, but you did see a vision. Now therefore give ye thanks, for I go up to him that sent me, for write all things which are done in the book. And when they arose, they saw him no more. Then they confessed confess the great and wonderful works of Yah, and how the angel of Yah had appeared unto them. Then Tobit wrote a prayer of rejoicing, and said, Blessed be Yah that lives forever, and blessed be his kingdom, for he does scourge and has mercy. He leads down to hell and brings up again. Neither is there any that can avoid his hand. Confess him before the Gentiles, you children of Israel, for he has scattered us among them. Therefore declare his greatness, and extol him before all the living, for he is our El, and he is the El of our Father. He is the El, our Father forever, and he will scourge us for our iniquities, and will have mercy again, and will gather us out of all nations among whom he has scattered us. If you turn to him with your whole heart and with your whole mind, and deal uprightly before him, then will he turn unto you, and will not hide his face from you. Therefore, see what he will do with you, and confess him with your whole mouth, and praise El of might, and extol the everlasting king. In the land of my captivity do I praise him, and declare his might and majesty to a sinful nation. O oh, you sinners, turn and do justice before him. Who can tell if he will accept you and have mercy on you? I will extol my El, and my soul shall praise the king of heaven, and shall rejoice in his greatness. Let all men speak, and let all praise him for his righteousness. O oh, Jerusalem. The holy city, he will scourge you for your children's works, and will have mercy again on the sons of the righteous. Give praise to Yah, for he is good, and praise the everlasting king, that his tabernacle may be built in you again with joy. And let him make joyful there in you those that are captives, and love in you forever those that are miserable. Many nations shall come from far to the name of Yah with gifts in their hands, even gifts to the king of heaven. All generations shall praise you with great joy. Cursed are all they which hate you, and blessed shall all be which love you forever. Rejoice and be glad for the children of the just, for they shall be gathered together and shall bless El of the just. O blessed are they which love you, for they shall rejoice in your peace. Blessed are they which have been sorrowful for all your scourges, for they shall rejoice for you when they have seen all your glory and shall be glad forever. Let my soul bless Yah, the great king. For Jerusalem shall be built up with sapphires and emeralds and precious stone, your walls and towers and battlements with pure gold. And the streets of Jerusalem shall be paved with beryl and carbuncle and stones of Ophir. And all her streets shall say, Hallelujah. And they shall praise him, saying, Blessed be Yah, which has extolled it forever. So Tobit made an end of praising Yah, and he was eight and fifty years old when he lost his sight, which was restored to him after eight years. And he gave alms, and he increased in the fear of Yah, and praised him. And when he was very aged, he called his son, and the sons of his son, and said to him, My son, take your children, for behold, I am aged, and am ready to depart out of this life. Go into media, my son, for I surely believe those things which Jonas, the prophet, spoke of Nineveh, that it shall be overthrown, and that for a time peace shall rather be in media, and that our brethren shall lie scattered in the earth from that good land, and Jerusalem shall be desolate, and the house of Yah in it shall be burned, and shall be desolate for a time, and that again will have mercy on them, and bring them in again into the land, where they shall build a temple, but not like to the first, until the time of that age be fulfilled. And afterward, they shall return from all places of their captivity and build up Jerusalem gloriously. And the house of Yah shall be built in it forever with a glorious building, as the prophets have spoken thereof. And all the nations, and all nations shall turn and fear Yah truly, and shall bury the idols. So shall all nations praise Yah, and his people shall confess Yah, and Yah shall exalt his people. And all those which love Yah in truth and in justice shall rejoice, showing mercy to our brethren. And now, my son, depart out of Nineveh, because that those things which the prophet Jonas spoke shall surely come to pass. But keep you the law and the commandments, and show yourself merciful and just, that it may go well with you. And bury me decently and your mother with me, but tarry no longer in Nineveh. Remember, my son, how Amon handled Acharias, 
Akiakalus that brought him up, how out of light he brought him into darkness, and how he rewarded him again. Yet Akiakalus was saved, but the other had his reward, for he went down into darkness. Manassas gives alms and escaped the snares of death, which they had set for him. But Amon fell into the snare and perished. Wherefore now, my son, consider what alms do and how righteousness does deliver. When he had said these things, he gave up the ghost and the bed, being a hundred and eight and fifty years old, and he buried him honorably. And when Anna his mother was dead, he buried her with his father. But Tobias departed with his wife and children to Ecbatane, to Raguel, his father-in-law, where he became old with honor, and he buried his father and mother-in-law honorably, and he inherited their substance and his father's Tobit. And he died at Ecbatane in Media, being a hundred and seven and twenty years old. But before he died, he heard of the destruction of Nineveh, which was taken by Nebuchadnezzar and Asarus. And before his death, he rejoiced over Nineveh. Well, I know some of you are familiar with Dr. Edwin Nichols. How many people are familiar with Ed? All right. Dr. Edwin Nichols, this is his work. And as a matter of fact, I wrote, a, I wrote a model based on his work, The Philosophical Aspects of Cultural Difference. And I'm only going to hit on one theme, because his, his work deals with axiology, epistemology, worldview, it's just a long process, but I'm going to only just zero in on axiology. He starts by explaining that we arrive at our primary value systems as groups of people, cultural groups or ethnic groups, if you will, based on one basic principle, and that's the principle of survival, which has lots of layers to it. But he talks about that fundamentally being the foundation of what a group knows and believes. And that the European axiology or primary value system is member or man to the object. Highest value lies in the object or in the acquisition of the object. And that object began many, many thousands of years ago in North Central Europe. And that object had a lot to do with what they needed to survive. What might that object be? Food. Fundamental. Five to eight thousand years ago in North Central Europe, you needed food, and there wasn't much of it. And so part of what they learned and what they had to contend with was living in an environment where they, it was very harsh. Very harsh, very cold, very short planting seasons. They were considered supreme deer hunter when they were deer around, and they worshipped trees. These are the things we know about what is known as barbaric Europe during that period of time. Now I want to contrast that with the African and the Latino axiology, which is man to man, member to member. Highest value lies in the relationship between people. Five to eight thousand years ago, tropical Africa, South America, how much time do you have to plant and grow your food? So what's the rush? We're not going to rush because we have plenty of time. We have plenty of time. Not only that, we have plenty of resources. If we run out of you know, roots, we'll fish. If we don't fish, we'll pick berries, but we'll get it done. And so we have a very different frame of reference and much of the focus. And of course, it had more to do than with food. It had more to do than just looking about and seeing what those physical resources was, but it had to do with what were the human resources necessary to survive. And those human resources were a collective, hence tribe, hence the notion of village. And so as African people, the primary value system that we had was one of being together. Now this is perfectly illustrated in something as simple as greeting. Every cultural group has its own greeting. How do Asians greet traditionally? They bow, right. When you begin to look at a very different thing, you look at European greeting. And European greeting 
again, it's a reflection of their primary value systems. And they, their greetings, it's perfunctory. It's a perfunctory greeting. Hello, how are you? How do you do? How do you do what? <laughs> my, my white friends are going, okay, Joy, you know, it was just a greeting. <laughs> That's all it was. Say hello. Because it's perfunctory. It's not, you know, it's just a formality. You kind of got to do it. Okay, now when Africans and Latinos greet, it's ceremonial, is it not? Think about it. We greet in ways that I don't think anybody else on the planet greets. I'm, I'm going to test it out today. Sir, could you stand up over here on the end? This brother here, stand up. Stand on up. Come on, stand on up. Okay. Let's see. Let's find somebody over here that, uh, that means. This brother here in the gray. Could you stand up, please, sir? Yes, you. And could you come over and greet this man? Could you meet him halfway and go in and greet him? trying to say. As you know, it can get into a snap and slap and all kind of stuff goes on, right? And Latinos will pick you up, kiss you, slap you in the face, all kind of stuff goes on. Right? Because the greeting is to establish the what? The relationship. Highest value lies in the relationship, right? So these are things that become very important and it's something that has transferred beyond one generation. It's gone over generations. It's not like someone taught you that, really. You know? When you're walking down the street and you're in the grocery store and you go, you know, <laughs> whenever I used to have my white friends with me, they go, Joy, you know so many people. <laughs> How do you know? I don't know them people. But I'm a green up. You know, and greeting becomes something very important. And, and you think about it, even your children. You know, when you have children, can you come in the house and walk past Aunt Dolores? Not and live. Didn't you see Aunt Dolores? And then you got people you try to not see, try to not acknowledge somebody that you know when you're out. Oh, wait a minute. You too good to see? <laughs> you too good? You know, it can, all kind of stuff can go awry. Right? So greeting becomes very important. Now I want you to consider something else. I want you to consider what something like American chattel slavery did to the relationship. A people whose whole existence, fundamental to their survival, was their relationships. There was nothing that could have more devastated a group of people whose primary value system was the relationship than American chattel slavery. It destroyed and devastated relationships. One of the most horrific and vile things that could have occurred. So, I started to take a look at that impact on a group of people it would have been different for any other group, but for African people, for American chattel slavery to exist, devastated the very foundation of the existence of African culture. And this is something we need to know. And yet, still we rise. It's phenomenal that we have. So I decided to take a look at this thing, this injury. I wanted to understand it because the first thing I started to realize is that it, it didn't, it morphed into something that no one seemed to acknowledge because whenever I talk about slavery, and I'll tell you, you get reactions when you say slavery, don't you? People, in the first thing they want to do is almost like the Million Man March. When the Million Man March happened, I'll never forget this. The first thing they did was found some black people to say it wasn't a good thing. Before it could be over with, they had people on television telling you how bad it was. And the first thing that happens when slavery comes out of the mouth of someone African or from African descent, oh, 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 that's all over now. It's, that, that, that has nothing to do with, that's all over. First thing that happens, they want to shut you down immediately. 
And to me, that's the first indicator that I need to pay attention to it. So they said, well, you know, Joy, that was a long time ago. Slavery's over. Get over it. I, was, I wasn't even there. I didn't do it. I'm tired of being guilty about it. I didn't do it. I don't want to hear about it. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. And that's true. I wasn't there either. I didn't do it. But you've got to know that 246 years of official slavery guaranteed that the progeny of the South, the white progeny, would have wealth for generations to come. And that the black progeny of the slaves would incur a debt that we have yet to shake off. So it doesn't matter if either of us was there. If we were there or not, it doesn't matter because the impact of that is present today. And that's the part that no one wants to talk about. That's the part that becomes uncomfortable to talk about. But we must talk about it if we are to lance the boil. So we need to begin to understand the ideology of how it is we've come to look at this blackness so negatively. Why is that so? These are God's choice of colors. How could it be? What does it mean? What does it create when you're dealing with someone that's not black? When you're dealing with someone, for example, that's white. So I went again to some literature and I wanted to see, is this happening on a pervasive level? I want you to know something, that whenever people oppress another group of people, it doesn't matter who they are, women, people of color, it doesn't matter who the group is, they have to remove the cognitive dissonance. Because if you're a good person, you render yourself a good person, you say that I'm a fair person, I'm a moral person, I'm a spiritual person, I don't do things that are bad to people, like, hello, enslave them. I don't do things that are mean and horrific. So in order for me to feel good about myself, I have to remove the cognitive dissonance, and I do this by, number one, justifying my behavior to ease the mind. And I justify that behavior by relabeling the people. I give them another label, then I can feel okay about who I am. I want to read this, and I want you to know that this was taken out of a fourth grade textbook in Oregon. And it was taken off the shelf by a gentleman by the name of Dan, um, Daryl Milner, who's the head of Black Studies. Daryl Milner took this off of the shelf, but for years, in the in late 80s, 85, he took it off the shelf. But nobody knew any, that there was anything wrong with it. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it and we're going to see if you're going to catch it. Because he read it over and over again to the then social studies teachers who didn't notice there was anything wrong with it. And it remained for many years. It starts off by saying environment. And then in big letters, John Muir. Have you ever visited Mount Rainier, the Grand Canyon, the Petrified Forest, or Yosemite? These places are all national parks today, in part because of the work of one man, John Muir. In the 1800s, millions of people began living in parts of the United States where no one had ever lived before. To make their living, people chopped down forests to have lumber for building and to clear land for farming. People put dams across rivers, they built roads, bridges, and railroads, and they dug mines. He read it over and over again. In the 1800s, millions of people began living in the parts of the United States where no one had ever lived before. Now, either Native Americans are not human beings or they're simply not worthy of mention. Are you following me? They read it over and over again. Nothing's missing here. But what happened to the Native American child sitting in that classroom? And what are the possibilities that they would confront that inaccuracy? Again, the attempt to erase. But why would you want to erase this group of people? What dissonance does it produce for you? What have you done to them? 
I want you to stay with me there. I simply look at this as something that's trivial. I eliminate it. I erase it because it creates what for me? Cognitive dissonance. We look at even the terms that are used in history, who the heroes are. We look at what they did. They would go in and slaughter people, but those were called victories. And when the Native Americans fought back, it was called massacres. So we have to understand the words that we use have a lot to do with how we perceive things, because words hurt, don't they? There's something about words that stay with us. And I want you to remember that as we move through. So then I had to take a look at these things and I'm going, so Joy, what exactly are we talking about? So I went to school, I went and got my, I, first of all I want to say I have a lot of degrees, but I don't particularly like school, okay? I ended up staying in there um, because I, I had difficulties with a lot of stuff. So I ended up with a lot of degrees because I was confused about a lot of stuff. But when I was going for my, my um, master's degree in clinical psychology, that was actually I was pursuing a, a spy degree or a PhD in psychology. And I just figured out I didn't like the psychology. I didn't like what it did to people. I didn't like the labels that it used. Because, you know, psychology was born out of, I think, in psychiatry, actually, the need to get paid. Come on. There's a book called the DSM, Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, right? And if you bill insurance, you better have a code. So if you don't have a sickness, I'm going to give you one. Because that's the only way I'm going to get paid. Now, surely there's something called mental illness. I wouldn't trivialize that. That's true. We do have a lot of mental illness. But I had a real problem with how people, quote, treated it. And one of the things that came up that people, my teachers, would talk about, there was a couple of things, but one of the things they would talk about is post-traumatic stress disorder. And I, you know, it's a long time ago, so I looked at post-traumatic stress disorder, I said, well, now, you know, that seems pretty interesting. And what, the first thing I wanted to know about post-traumatic stress disorder is, well, who gets it? And what is this thing? Actually, post-traumatic stress disorder was born out of shell shock. How many of you are familiar with that, that term, shell shock? And shell shock is one of those things that happened, they, for lack of a better word, they didn't know what to call it, for veterans, people who were in war, that would come back and they'd have these behaviors because they were, you know, looking at people getting killed and this sort of thing. So I wanted to see who they listed. And these are the folks they listed that apparently had traumas as a result of some major stress. Identified groups. This is in that book called the DSM. Victims of rape, war veterans, heart attack victims. I'm going to talk about that one for a minute. Victims of natural disaster and victims of severe accidents. That's who's listed. And heart attack victims are often listed because when a person has a heart attack, their greatest fear is that the next one's going to do what? Right. So it creates a certain level of a stress. So they end up with... So I said, but where are the slaves? Seems to me slaves ought to be on here. And when I brought that to my professors, they said, oh, no, 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 that was too long ago. We, that couldn't work. I'm going, well, it, it just seems to me they ought to be there, right? So, you know, I had a lot of problems in my program, you know. For example, one of the things I asked them is, you know, we studied Freud, Rogers, and everybody, all the theorists, all of whom were men, all of whom were white men, and most of their patients were white women still are. So I started to look at that behavior and I was questioning and I said, now tell me this, just, I'm just curious and I brought this up at one of those meetings where they had a faculty and a graduate students and they wanted to have inclusion. So they wanted to have, help us get to a feeling of everyone being included. So I said, I have a question for you. I said, I want you to consider every single person that has been healed as a result of, you know, psychotherapy and psychodynamic therapy and whatever, whatever theory you want. All of them, Adler, everybody, bring them in. I want you to consider everyone that says, I did this and then I was healed. And I want you to compare that number to the number of people on the planet that said, I had faith. I had a God and I knew it wasn't me. How many of them believe that that is what healed them? And there was a little hush. <laughs> okay. 
And they were going, well, you know, uh, well, you know, you know, I can't measure that. I go, oh, yeah, we can. We can measure that. Ask people. Right? So I'm in the room with the people. I said, is it not a fact that there are more people that have been healed as a result of what they believe in their heart and their faith and prayer than what all of these combined theorists came up with? You know, that's why I knew I had to go. <laughs> that wasn't, I wasn't going to make it there very long. Because they didn't want to deal with that truth. They didn't want to deal with that truth. Instead, they, you get in and they erase spirituality. Or they try to figure out how to package it and sell it. So then I asked this question about slaves. And they said it was too long ago. I said, well, why was it too long ago to diagnose? Well, because post-traumatic stress disorder only occurs for a, over a period of time for a person that has experienced a trauma. I said, okay. So let's look at what happens. What are the kinds of things that people begin to behave like? This is what they would behave like if you have post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, you all know in New York, because of the, yeah, 9-11. When 9-11 happened, the entire country was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. But not everybody had post-traumatic stress disorder based on those buildings coming down. It was a tragic event, but not everybody was traumatized by that. Matter of fact, I would submit to you that there were folks traumatized long before that. But there was something that happened when people saw those objects crumble. And what those objects represented to America, what they were a symbol of, the World Trade Center. It wasn't just the lives that were lost. It was the symbol of what it meant. And that was wrapped in the notion of power and control and stability, all of those things, greatness. So many people experience post-traumatic stress disorder. Some people can't get on airplanes today, and they were nowhere near New York. So I understand that people experience that. Now let's see how they behave when they have been traumatized. Intense psychological stress and distress at the exposure to internal or external cues that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the trauma or the traumatic event. So I would imagine that if people, you know, were walking around and they were around tall buildings or they saw airplanes going over, that this would trigger, are you following me? Physiological reactivity to exposure to the, the external or internal event. So again, you'd have a physical response. Marked diminished interest or per, uh, participation in significant activities. This is a person who no longer wants to do things. Feeling of detachment or estrangement from others. Restricted range of affect. Unable to have loving feelings. A sense of foreshortened future. Does not expect to have a career, marriage, children, or a normal lifespan. Difficulty falling or staying asleep. Irritability or outbursts of anger. Difficulty concentrating. Hypervigilance. Exaggerated startle response. These are the behaviors of an individual that's been traumatized. These are the symptoms that they are living with. So they go to a doctor and they try to get us some medication. And if you're poor and don't know about that, you self-medicate. So this is what people do. And I'm going, okay, that makes sense to me. Now let's see. Let's look at the diagnostic features of post-traumatic stress disorder. These are what the most common trauma involved. And so once again, I said to my professors, but are you saying that slaves didn't have this? They said, Joy, that was too long ago. I said, okay. So what I started to do, like I asked my audiences to do, let's take a look at what these features are, and you and I will determine if maybe some of the slaves had it. Because, you know, they constantly tell us how happy we were during slavery. You, even if you pick up any textbook in, in, in our schools, they'll show you the happy slaves. Won't they? Nice little cabin folks playing the banjo happily eating pig entrails and watermelon, grateful for the master. Isn't that what they show us? 
Because we need to see those pictures because we need to remove the what? The cognitive dissonance. We need to believe that what, the way we treated you was just, like, and you was happy about it too. That's why those pictures are there. So I'm going to give them that. All three of the slaves that were happy, and even the few that are still happy today, I'm going to give you them. So now, let's look at this, and let's determine if in fact, and the thing about the DSM, because you know you need to be able to get the money, right? So if a person is diagnosed with dysthymia, which is, you know, a kind of recurring depression, ongoing depression, chronic depression, you have, you, know, you don't have to have all the features of depression, for example, to get that diagnosis. You only need a couple of them. <laughs> okay, maybe one you can get, you know. So I want you to bear in mind that you didn't have to have all of these to get the diagnosis. But I want you to tell me if you think outside of the three happy slaves, I want you to tell me if you think the, the rest of them might have experienced these. A serious threat to or a harm to one's life or physical integrity. They get that one. Threat or harm to one's children, spouse, or close relatives. Sudden destruction of one's home or community. Seeing another person injured, killed as a result of an accident or physical violence. Learning about a serious threat to a close friend, a relative kidnapped, tortured, or killed. Stressor is experienced with intense fear, terror, and helplessness. Disorder is considered to be more serious and will last longer when the stressor is of human design. That's seven out of seven. You think they might have had it. Of course they did. And do you remember how I described exaggerated startle response, difficulty staying or falling asleep, Outbursts of anger, exaggerated emotions is what we're talking about. A person that doesn't see a future for themselves. I want you to consider that person. And so everyone would agree that slaves had it. Did they treat the slaves when they had it? So during that time, did the master say, I notice you've been stressed lately. I'm thinking you need a little help. You think? No, they didn't get any help. And did they experience one trauma? Now understand that there were people that weren't, they weren't there in New York when it occurred. They were in somewhere in New Zealand watching it on TV and they need to go to therapy behind it. So how is it we think that these people who lived a lifetime of trauma lifetime, that they did not suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. So I think most would agree it doesn't take, you know, it's, in, it's not even plausible to assume they didn't have it. That's plain foolish. That's called, it has face validity. So now we know they had it. And how long did slavery last? Okay. They had it over a duration. And then when mother had it, because that was mom and dad and aunt and everybody else, who had it raising Johnny, yes? So Johnny was dealing with someone that had difficulty staying or falling asleep, exaggerated, exaggerated startle response, outbursts of anger, feeling of foreshortened future and doom. That was mama raising Johnny. And did Johnny get some traumas? And did little Mary get some traumas? And that's what they named us. So what I'm trying to say and what I began to do is not far-fetched. That's not some, some rugged emotionalism that I'm talking about here. This makes sense. It simply makes sense. So now that we know it makes sense that the slaves had it, they say, but you know, Joy, that was so long ago. Y'all been free. Y'all free now, ain't you? You're free. And what did freedom give us? So you have now all of these hundreds of years of slavery. Hundreds of years of it. And then people will say, well, you know, you know, you, there's always been slavery, Joy. There's always been slavery. Matter of fact, you people enslaved. And 
there is in fact true to that. People did have slaves, but not the kind of slavery that Americans had. Romans had slaves. I mean, almost every society had slaves, but not like America had slaves. Because American slavery, most people enslaved people of their own race, first of all. That's what happens. And that person was not considered less than human. Africans were considered less than human. They were considered de facto slaves because of the Aristotelian notion of a natural slave. The color of the skin raises the presumption of slavery, said Aristotle, which deems them fitted to slavery permanently. They will never, ever reach the bastions of normalcy as it relates to whiteness. They will never be fully human. Three-fifths. So what we have to understand is that the nature of American chattel slavery was unlike anything anywhere else, nor did anything else share in its duration. So we're talking about a real severe process. Now, how many of you are familiar with the ma'afa? The ma'afa is a key Swahili word that means the great suffering. You have a wonderful celebration of the acknowledgement of those on whose shoulders we stand right here in your fair uh, state. The St. Paul Community Baptist Church does a ma'afa commemoration and many others are doing it around the country now. And so what was the state of things during the ma'afa? And that's the middle passage of slavery. You know, Malik Youssef has a, has a poem he says and he talks about how little kids try to describe the fact that we came over on a cruise. But on a cruise, you're not usually abused. So this was a real different kind of a cruise. So let's take a look at that. And there's a lot of argument around how many people died during the Middle Passage of slavery. The lowest figure documented with some level of accuracy is 9 million. That's the lowest one. And we don't tie a yellow ribbon on for them. We don't ever acknowledge them. When do you remember us acknowledging them? When? And they punished Spielberg when he tried to acknowledge it. So we need to understand that these were, these were millions of men, women, and children that perished in the trip over. Millions. And we don't ever acknowledge them. Doesn't that seem odd to you? How could that be? We've not forgotten. We have not forgotten, but they have been erased mysteriously from the pages of history. They've been erased. And why do we erase people? To remove the what? The dissonance. Even during the filming of Amistad, the actors weeped, not on cue because they couldn't help but weep. It got so they couldn't have white people chaining them. They had to bring in black people to do it because it was that unbearable. Spielberg knew. Why did he know? Because he didn't forget his Holocaust. He didn't. And you shouldn't. So what I began to realize is that we have, this has morphed into a kind of lie that the annals of history, past or future, will never have seen. This is the biggest lie that has ever been told, as though it never occurred. How could we forget them? Millions. And what was the trip like? Well, you know that some of the cargo ships, they wanted to pack as many in as they could. They overbooked, if you will. And they did that for one reason. They did it because they needed to ensure that a certain number would go to market. It's like any other cargo you have. Some of it will spoil and perish. And so they had to figure that out. So they packed in, oh, tons of people, rows of people, 18 inches apart, 18 inches surrounding them for sometimes months. 18 inches, stay with me here, stench filled, rodents, feces, it's where they ate, it's where they slept, 
It's where they wept. It's where they urinated. It's where they defecated. It's where they vomited. And it's where they gave birth and where they died. In 18 inches of space. How could we forget that? But y'all are free. So when we begin to look at this, it's not a pretty picture. And I understand why people run from it. But my children need to know who paid for them. In my book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, America's Legacy of Enduring Injury and Healing, many people have said, you know, Joy, where's the book? Where's the book? And one of the things that happened to me when I started to write the book is there was so much I needed to fold in those pages. So much. And the second process is, you know, how do I market it? How do I sell it? How do I do all those things? And who's going to have the final call on what's going to go in it? That would be me. So I'm not getting ready to sell it to a publishing house and be raped with my injury. Can't, can't happen. <laughs> it just can't happen. So I'm self-publishing the book for those reasons. I want to read this because I think it's, it speaks to the assault in a very very good way during slavery so now we know what the trip over was like let's look at what to understand that slavery is an, the antithesis of what it means to feel human it is not a normal process for a human being to be in bondage for the rest of their lives period When we discuss living enslaved, we are discussing only degrees of abuse. I have actually heard people attempt to justify slavery by arguing that many slaves didn't have it so bad. They claim some were even treated extremely, extremely well and were better off than people who were destitute and left to their own devices. Now this has to do with poverty. You had something called Elizabethan poor laws. This is when Europeans, and if you really want to understand this, you have to understand what Europeans did to Europeans. And this, anyone that was poor was considered immoral, irreligious, and they were often imprisoned for being poor. And that's where you got something called able-bodied. If you were able-bodied, then you had no reason. If you had an able body, there was something called deserving poor. Right? So there are obviously those who didn't deserve anything. That were poor. I mean, the whole idea that these people were indentured to keep them spiritually okay. The notion was that this was spiritually important for these people. Poor people were, were irreligious people, is what was believed. And that's amazing when you consider religion and what we're supposed to do as religious people as it relates to the poor. All I can say is that these people are among the worst of hypocrites, for who among them would willingly give up their freedom under any conditions? Once again, let me be perfectly clear about this. Slavery by its very nature is abusive and abhorrent to the human spirit. It was no accident that the state of New Hampshire adopted as its motto, live free or die. Freedom means that much to all of us. It is detestable that constitutions were written and laws enacted to develop and maintain the institution of slavery. Slaves had not even the simplest of human rights. How many of you are familiar with the Casual Killing Act? Now, the Casual Killing Act was written so that if in the correcting of a slave, the slave was killed during that correction, it was not accounted a felony, but they were acquit of all wrongdoing as if such act had never occurred. Casual killing act. Well, why would you have to beat a slave so badly? Well, you couldn't find them because they had no money. And if you jailed them, their labor was lost to you. So you beat them severely, and so severely sometimes, you kill them. And do understand that women beat their slaves to death, many of them. Not just the men. So I began to look at that and I started to try to understand 
how much, because see, you know how when you tell a lie, you try to keep it going? And you forget what you lied about. You know, you just, because it just, it becomes a mess. So when we start trying to cover up this horrible deed, it gets more complex. We have to write constitutions and laws. So you have to ask yourself this question. There's a book called Southern Slavery and the Law. And these, this book is that book right over, big thick book. All of that was about the laws that were created to maintain the institution of slavery. That's how complicated. The same thing happened with apartheid. Part of what a toppled apartheid was the trying to maintain the separateness. It got insane. It became financially impossible. Too many toilets. Too many bathrooms. Too many. It got crazy. White colored, you know, it got crazy. And to maintain the institution of slavery, you had to maintain laws and you had to also calm the mind, did you not? So let's calm the mind. So the first thing we have to do is make everybody feel okay about this thing called slavery. Right? So remember I told you we have to up the ante and go to science? So now we have to understand they created laws so that if you kill black people, you weren't, haven't done anything wrong. Don't feel bad about that. Didn't you say we're just correcting him? Okay. You know, you can go home absolved of any wrongdoing because you were simply correcting him. There it is in the law. Are you following me? Okay, so now the law is protecting me if I should kill him. So now let's just start kind of understanding how we have to now indoctrinate the country. We've got to indoctrinate everyone into this belief system, even you and I, friends. It had to come from somewhere. When I started walking around and hearing little children use as a way of cursing someone the color of their skin, you black, you nappy-headed, start thinking about it. Or when you start looking at the, and I want you to stay with me here because this gets real deep. When you start looking at people and how they get disciplined, you go to the south and start looking at how children get disciplined. Boy, go fetch me a few switches I'm going to braid them together. I'm going to soak them in water. I'm going to have you pull your pants down, and I'm going to beat you. Does that sound like something that might have came from somewhere else? Think about it. And after a while, you, we begin to normalize that behavior, but you've got to understand where it came from. That's a whip. And I'm going to make you go get it. I want you to begin to understand that we've got to be careful about what we call cultural. We've got to be careful about that. So now when we begin to look at that, truly. And the reason, I, you know, it's not an indictment, it's an understanding of how we've never been able to heal. Because we've, and through this whole process, first of all, you can't even talk about it. We can't, even, we can't even talk about it as though it didn't happen. 246 official years. And if you want to topple that and look a little further, it didn't end when it ended. So when we look at these behaviors, we, when in there, I mean, I always ask, because I'm sure that maybe someone in the audience knows something I don't know. Do you remember the free therapy? Anybody? <laughs> Surely somebody here remembers the lines or something. Where the sign up was, you put your ex and you can come get the therapy because we treated you really badly. You don't remember that? None of it ever happened, did it? That makes us an incredible people, doesn't it? I mean, I mean really, when you start doing the math on this, it's amazing. It's amazing what we've been able to do. So let's look at what they did to calm the mind on a more pervasive level. So when you begin to look at the statutes, every state had a statute around casual killing and you know, how, many, how often you could you know, beat them and all whatever. But let's look at now, this is how it becomes morphs into something else. This is when it becomes part of your consciousness, gets slid, you know, slides on in there without you knowing it. Often I read this, but it's very important because it becomes the foundation of the scientific community's justification of slavery. 
Carl von Linnaeus. Carl von Linnaeus, who lived 1707 to 1778, developed a taxonomic system based on a criterion of skin color and laid the basis for 19th century racial classification. Linnaeus properly began the science of anthropology. This gentleman is a father of anthropology. Although color classification of races dated back to the ancient Egyptians, anthropologists referred to Linnaeus' taxonomy in his Systema Natura of 1735 as the first modern study of man. 1735, we're now trying to understand or categorize, classify human beings. And they'll say, although color classification dated back to the ancient Egyptians, I want you to pay attention to that. Why don't they want to ever attribute to Africa, Egypt? Why don't, won't they, why don't they let us have Egypt? Because we do have it, Egypt. Why won't they let us have it? Because when we look at the knowledge base, that was there, that emerged from there, the civilization that emerged from there. Case in point, when I was going to go for my final exams in my psychology program, ultimately you have to take the Hippocratic Oath. Okay? Now, when I first entered my physiology of the brain, neurophysiology class, I walked into the class with a big, thick book. If it fell on you, it would kill you. Right? It's a medical book because this was a medical aspect of what I was to learn. And I'm thinking, Lord, I mean, all the people, big thick glasses were sitting in the front, you know, the glass. And I'm thinking, I'm going to have to take it twice, I'm sure. <laughs> Certain of it, right? So I'm sitting in the class, and I'm looking at the book, big, giant, thick book. And I open the front page. It's a glossy picture, and I'm looking at the front page, and I look around, I'm going, I can... I can read what's on the front page, and no one else in the class could read what was on the first page of the book because it was written in hieroglyphics, and I can read basic hieroglyphics, and it said brain. And I'm like, whoa, it says brain and hieroglyphics on the front page of my neurophysiology book. I'm pretty excited. Now I'm thinking maybe I could take it. <laughs> so I open the front page, and there is a glossy picture that was found in one of the tombs of the first ever recorded brain surgery. You know, and they're showing you the drill and the hole in and the whole thing. And this is interesting because this is a front page. But when I graduate, I have to take what oath? The Hippocratic oath? Because Hippocrates was what? The father of? I have a problem, don't you? Imhotep is the father of medicine. Not only that, it's no secret because you can't hide a pyramid yet. He built the Giza Step Pyramid. So, it, so are we confused? I want you to understand how deep this stuff is. Then they'll go, well, now if they, we got the first recorded brain surgery, which predates this man. Well, we're going to say that he's a father of modern medicine. Okay. Well, why are we still giving an oath to him? It becomes a thing where you have to question the psychology of it. And I'm saying they're showing me the truth and daring me to question it. Daring me to question it. I sat down and I know I had, you know, when I, I mentioned this because it astounds me, this particular one. When I ask everyone to tell me the continents, and I don't care what you say about this, tell me how many continents there are. People tell me there's seven. But before we can tell somebody there's seven continents, we've got to tell you what a continent is. They give you the definition. A large landmass, partly or completely surrounded by water. So we talk about Africa. Now, oh, yeah, 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 that makes sense. North America, South America, you know, you name them all. You start looking at, you know, Antarctica, Australia. It's all making sense. Then you get to Europe. Europe. Europe is neither large nor surrounded by water. I want you, it's a peninsula. But wait, wait. People look at them and go, what do you know? Yeah. You, you get children, they take a test. Let them not put Europe on there. 
You've given them the rule. You've told them what it is. It is a bald-faced lie, and we still do it. Then you decide to name a continent Eurasia. Why would you name the whole continent based on a peninsula? Even if you want to tag it on, why would you call it Eurasia? We did it. We looked at it. We read it. We understood the, the process of what defines it, and we wrote it down. That is how deeply ingrained the pathology is to remove the dissonance. And we can't give you Egypt, because if we give you Egypt, then we're going to give you a level of intellectual capacity that we have deemed you unfit to have. Okay, so I want you to understand the psychology that goes into this. It's not something, people look at it, they want to deny our kings and queens. They want to deny that it could be you. Because if, I, if I'm going to subjugate and oppress someone that I consider beneath me, how can we look at civilization so great and justify that behavior? You see, it starts messing with the math. So I'll just simply take it out of Africa. And we bought that too. No one stopped in the British Museum and said, excuse me, there's been a major error here. <laughs> you know, you can't take Egypt out of Africa. You've got to put it back in there where the, the African stuff is. Nobody questioned it because it, it fed on our need to remove all of the guilt associated and all of the doubt associated with what was going on. So let's see what else he said. While Linnaeus advanced classification with the use of a color criterion, he also fixed on its four families of man certain moral and intellectual peculiarities that continued into the 19th century anthropological vocabulary. He described Homo Americanus. Okay. As reddish, choleric, obstinate, contented, and regulated by customs. That would be Native Americans. That would be the people we erased earlier. Homo Europaeus, and I think white people ought to be bothered by this one. Homo Europaeus as white, fickle, sanguine, blue-eyed, gentle, and governed by laws. Homo Asiaticus as sallow, grave, dignified, avaricious, and ruled by opinions. And Homo Afer as black, phlegmatic, cunning, lazy, lustful, and governed by caprice. These insights into what Linnaeus defined as racial character, personality traits, behavior, intelligence, language, and a host of other related categories were transmitted into subsequent attempts at a science of classification and became more fixed than the races themselves. Not a shred of science here. zippity doo dah None. In a book. And the bottom line is you've heard these things attributed to us. Dude, we, I want to, let's move in on that word lazy. We built the country. And what we didn't do, the Chinese did and the natives did. We are lazy. We fed your babies. You couldn't even do that. But the problem is that what, not that it's a lie, but you, that we buy it. We, we will buy that about ourselves. When you go to right now the burial ground, when you go to the burial ground, what was so phenomenal about what I learned about that burial ground was how hard people worked. There were stress injuries. In other words, a man about 6'5 would have an injury that would cause the muscle to detach itself from the bone as a result of exertion. Who works so hard that the muscle detaches itself from the bone? No human being does that willingly, but you will if you have a gun trained on you. And then they turn around and call you lazy. And then we begin to buy that imagery. We begin to believe that imagery, friends, and for years and years of hearing it, we begin to believe it. Just like we began to believe Europe was a continent. So what I'm saying to you that these things were calculated to ease the mind, to remove the, 
the dissonance. But what it creates, what does a secret create? It creates pathology. Secrets are those things that make us all sick. Secrets are what release the poison that creates the boil. And so what we have to understand about this is not so much what it did to others, but what did that do to us? What did we come to believe about who we are? I'll tell you, it's the reason why we all go, I heard that somebody got shot on new news. That wasn't nobody black, was it? Oh, tell me that wasn't. Was he black? We start taking it on, right? Or we'll get in a room and we start having this discussion and someone white will get upset and someone black will stand up to protect them. Because we're so used to protecting white people from any discomfort. So when I began to look at the fear, I started to ask them, I said, what are you afraid of? And I had a white gentleman stand up in one of my classes and say, I'm afraid because I know that I have unearned privilege. And you ought to be mad about that. And so my assumption is that when you look at me, you see that. And that you might reflect that and maybe want to hurt me. And then, of course, everything I see on the news is that you are violent. For example, in the Rodney King riot, I remember looking at the statistics, you know, based on what I understood about what was going on, and then what the news covered. The news made it a black, real black thing. 51% of the folks out on the street rioting were Latino. 51%. But it was a black thing. So we have to understand that when, and then I went further when I said about this fear thing. So I said, so let me get this right. You are afraid because you know you have unearned privilege. Yes. As a white male, I'm clear about that. I'm not proud of it. I'm not comfortable with it. And I, I sense agitation around that. <laughs> I said, okay. I said, so now what do you think happens? Because when white people are afraid, folks get lynched. Okay, stuff gets real ugly when white people get afraid. So I really want to understand his answer. Because my son's life may stand in the balance of that answer. And what I came to understand, that when white people say in the audience, the one way that black people adversely impact the lives of white people is because we are afraid, then we have to understand what their solution to that is. And the solution is, you need to understand that I'm afraid of you because of my unearned privilege that you might be angry about because I know you've been oppressed as a result of that privilege, but you need to take care of me so I can feel comfortable with it. So we all know what's going on, but I insist that you make me feel comfortable about my unearned privilege. Because that's what we're supposed to do, you see. Because then you wouldn't be afraid. So what I want to explain to you is that's how deep the pathology is. Oh my God, I'm feeling upset and a little guilty. There's got to be something wrong. What have you done? You need to stop. I think he needs to be removed from the room because I've become upset because it is so unnatural an emotion for me to have a discomfort. You need to be removed because you're making me uncomfortable. In other words, your presence and existence is a discomfort to me. Now either you remove yourself or I will have you removed. That's the story. So let's move forward so that we can understand that, again, you know, I didn't make it up because it became now not only a part of the literature, it became, it became the pictures. It became what we saw when we started to look at the minstrel shows. Remember the minstrel shows, what happened? All of the imagery that began to solidify those images of the shuffling, lazy, ignorant slave. To such a degree that we became embarrassed because we bought that the image was real. That's why we became ashamed of them. But we have to understand that nobody white looks at something someone else white does and takes all that on. They don't. They could be the president. And they'll tell you, well, you know, he's a fool. I have nothing to do with me. I'm so embarrassed as a white person, they don't feel that. They go, there just goes another fool if they happen to have that particular perspective of him. You see what I'm saying? So there's, but we take it on. 
Hence, anybody black, doesn't matter who they are, stands up and says something, we all buy it and own it and believe like we got to defend it. You know, somebody will ask me about, you know, why did that man, that black man have a, what do he have, a tiger in his apartment? I go, what makes you think I know why he had a tiger in his apartment? Now, what's deep is some of us will try, try to answer that. You know, that's outrageous. That's when we have to say, there's a fool. That's all there was, a fool. Don't have nothing to do with me. But we take it on because we have a collective injury, you see. And that's why when I talk about the transmission of post-traumatic slave syndrome, I tell you that it's transmitted. It's not enough to just deal with the family or the individual. You've got to deal with the community because that's where it's reinforced, is it not? Here's where it is. So one of the things that I started to do, and understand that American chattel slavery ended followed by peonage, unlawful selling of slaves into slavery, followed by black codes adopted by different states that says you can't come here even though you're free, north, south, east, west, don't matter, we don't want you. Sundown laws, right? Then we had convict lease laws where we arrested all of the, the beginning of, again, another fractioning, arresting all of these black men, principally, but not only black men, and, and, and imprisoning them with sentences that were, first of all, they were trumped up charges to begin with. And that's where overrepresentation started. Someone needs to do research on that alone to understand what was the impact of convict leasing on present-day overrepresentation of African Americans in the criminal justice system. There is a direct link. I can't do all that research. But it's, do you see what I'm saying? We need to do it because the link is a natural line. They said it worked then, it'll work now. The only thing we got to do is get them to buy it. So they show you criminality over and over again to the extent that we're afraid of us. To the point where we begin to think that we're violent, horrible people. And so then when the bill gets passed, we sign our people away. We do it. And they say, they did it. They did it. Do you see what I'm saying? We need to take a look at that. There's research that needs to be done there. I did some research on that. But I can't do all of it. So we have to begin to look at those behaviors and those kinds of things that produce this. So when I say that it moves from the individual, family, community, it's reinforced over and over again. We all never got in a room and talked about it, but we have the same wounds. When I was on Gil Noble's show, what I found out was we have the same stories. If I had an open mic today and put it right there in front, every one of you could get up and tell a story that we could all relate to, couldn't you? But let me tell you something, when white people hear us, they go, you know, that, I think you're exaggerating. That, that was just, that person just probably had a, had, had a bad day that day. It had nothing to do with your race. But what if they heard an audience full of people 2004 say, yes, it did. And if you don't believe his story, let me tell you my story and her story and his story. We ain't making it up. This is not a figment of our imagination. It's alive and well and killing us today. That's real. So what does it look like transmitted from one group to the next? And this is an interesting dynamic because we do it. It starts on the level of the individual. Because I tell you about mom and daddy are broken during slavery. And let me tell you how that breaking process happened. Y'all know how Willie Lynch explained it. But I want to talk specifically what you do to dehumanize, to denigrate a people to the point where they learn to be helpless. Because you learn helplessness. And the way learned helplessness occurs is tests were done with animals, animal subjects, conditioned response, Skinner, Pavlov. These were people who started to look at conditioned response. And you know much of what has been said about how people were enslaved. Because Malcolm said that you take the chains off their ankles and you put it where? Put it on their mind. You don't ever have to worry about them. Right? And I often give this analogy. This was amazing. My husband and I were up one night. We like to watch the animal planet. And we watch all those animals. I know everything about snakes, everything. It's interesting. And this one time, I was in the other room, and I was hearing, and there was one series where they said, when good animals go bad or something. And, you know, the little nice foo-foo starts attacking the family and stuff. 
And they had this one episode of an elephant. It was an African bull elephant in a circus that got done. He said, you're getting off my back and all y'all getting up out of here. (laughs) Elephant went wild, right, running through, stomping people. You know, I'm done. And then they brought in a zoologist to explain the elephant's behavior. I swear to you, this is what he said. Well, you have to consider taken from its homeland, chained on a long journey, beaten, treated illly, separated, fed poorly, sick, and then under someone's whip constantly, it's expected that he would do what he did. And I came back out, I'm going, (laughs) you can see the elephant. It gets reinforced, and part of what happens if you tie an elephant, you know, if you, as a matter of fact, if you knock a large animal down, they get blown out because nothing can knock them down, right? But if you can stop and chain an elephant, if you can stop it from moving against its will, and you're not an elephant, that elephant learns helplessness. They will chain, and not, now to this day, you can actually walk into different, where there, there are circuses and they'll have zookeepers and they'll have all these different people that'll be working with different areas of the animals, little circus folks. And you'll see the elephants standing next to the chains. Chains not on the elephant. But it's so used to being chained, it won't move. Matter of fact, you can tie a thread around it and it won't move. Because it can't, it doesn't believe it can move. So learned helplessness is a process of after a while, you hear it over and over again that you are dysfunctional, that you are backwards, that you are underachieving, and you're not making benchmarks. You are all of those things over again. You begin to believe it's true. That's what um, in Riceville, Iowa, what Jane Elliott proved by brown eyes, blue eyes, in the course of two weeks, changed the scores permanently. The score was changed permanently academically for those children who believed they were on top and those that believed they were on the bottom. So what we have to understand is, "Mm, I think probably, you know, the last 400 years has been one hell of a conditioning for us. And that that self-hatred, I heard a brother say to me yesterday, we have to love ourselves enough so that we can out-love how much we hate ourselves. And so we have to get to a point where we understand how we came to do this. So how does it look? Let me give you this example because you all know about it. If you're in a, in a bank, you're about my age. No, you've got to be younger than me because I'm not going to be standing in line that long. But let's say you are um, in your 30s and you're looking at a woman or a man in their 30s and they have small children and their children are where in proximity to them in the bank. It's small children, three, four, five-year-olds. They're actually really very close to you. Very close, so close, in fact, they are touching you sometimes, holding on to your leg. And as you move, they move, all in lockstep together, the whole crew. It's a very unusual sight, but we see it every day. And if the child, and again, I teach human development, and it's normal for children to move about and stray. That's how they learn. There's a certain thing called secure attachment and insecure attachment. And a child that has secure attachment will wander about and talk to people and feel safe. But if our children move, get, get, get over here. You know, you'll see it. That little thing. The child, just, just a little bit to the right. The child can't move. Well, I started to do the research, so I would ask, you know, the mother why that child don't need to be running around the bank. Okay. Meanwhile, same bank, white mother. Three, four, five year old. Honey. Honey. Come back. Oh, no, leave, don't leave that man. I'm put that down. Child is swinging on the little ropes and sliding down the aisles and running up and down and talking to you, annoying everybody in the bank. And the mother's just gently going, oh, no, no, run. you know, same bank. Other child, get you. Right. Now, there's something going on in that dynamic. One of the dynamics is that this mother is behaving this way, and everyone, you know, is watching. The little white kids are looking at the little black kids. There's two things going on. It's going both ways. The black kid is learning, oh, he can run, and she can run and play, but I'll get in trouble. 
And the white kid learns, hmm, they must not be able to run and play. I wonder why they got to stay over there. What's wrong with them? Their message is going being sent, right? So now children are going to stay and be obedient to their parents. So when the mother, of course, or father gets to the bank teller, kids are lower than the counter. I've watched this. I'm not making this up. So the child, children try, will still try to explore because it is part of their task of human development to do so. So the child is going to try to escape. It's normal. The child's trying to escape. Mama can't see me. I'm sliding down the aisle. Underneath the, underneath the little counter, Mama doesn't notice. I'm almost free. Some other black people in the line step out the line. Right? They don't know the mother or the father or the children. They give the death stare. <laughs> right? <laughs> Little kid goes, oh, wow. <laughs> Get back in line. No, nothing's exchanged. Now we're looking at not just the individual and the family. What is the other level of transmission? Now it's being reinforced on a community level. No words are exchanged. You see, because we've all taught each other that i got to have your back. And I appreciate that. But what we're doing is we are crippling our children. In so doing, not a word is transmitted. And that's why it can't happen when people say, well, can you? Because they love for post-traumatic slave syndrome to end up in a book somewhere where they can bill it. Right? They'd love for you to find a pill to fix it. But post-traumatic slave syndrome cannot be solved in that way because it also implies a need for justice. And that means that it's got to heal on all those levels. We have to not only take ownership of ourselves, but ownership of our communities, right? We have to learn that self-sufficiency. So it is something communicated on a variety of levels, and so as a result of that, we have to deal with it on a variety of levels. We've got to heal the individual, the family, and the community. 